Okay, guys, I apologize about that. And it was back for this. So, okay, all right. So let's, now let's see, basically, I mean, um, the stationarity condition that I want to introduce here for autodogastic processes. And first off, I mean, that was, this was the, the last lemma that we were considering. Okay, so basically we had that, let's say, if the process, okay, so we had a first order autoregressive process, which was basically given by constant times slope and first time leg of the process plus a white noise, then uh, of course we had that the, um, that there is a representation of the process that you know, right? So and uh, you have the constant times 1 over 1 minus a plus the sum of the white noises where each of them are weighted by the factor 1 to the power of j. Okay, so this is, this is, um, this is the representation that we were considering last time. Okay? And of course, we had that if, let's say, if the time, okay, so if time is not bounded from the low, okay? And basically that the absolute value of A is less than one, then the process is stationary, okay? And both the mean and the variance, and as well as the auto covariance were given in uh, I mean, I was uh, writing down some expressions for them, but basically what you have seen is that uh, these things do not depend on time, okay? So basically, I mean, this is uh, what we consider, okay? And now this, we're gonna show this, okay? So that that is something that we, we are, we're gonna look at, okay? So, I mean, of course, if, if time is not bounded from below, then this is the representation that we have. So all we need to do got this restriction. So ba basically what we do is we calculate the expectation, we calculate the variance, and we're going to calculate the optical covariance of this process and then to verify the statement that this is not stationary. All right? So basically, I mean, the first thing is easy. Right? So the expectation is relatively easy. Okay. So this is what you're going to look at. So we have basically we have the expectation of the whole thing, okay, so the constant and um, the sum, right? So here you have A, J, and the, the, the white noise, okay? And then, of course, basically the expectation of that thing, I mean, we have a linear transformation that is going to be the linear transformation of the expectation. So basically we have that the constant, okay? So this is the constant, and then the expectation of the sum. Now the expectation of the sum is the sum of the expectations, okay? So we have infinity here, and basically we have that this is going to be a to the power of j times the expectation of the white noises. Now the expectation of the white noises is equal to zero, right? So this is what we're gonna what we're gonna have. So this is gonna be equal to zero, obviously. So hence, of course, the whole thing is going to be zero. So basically, we have v over one minus a. That's the that's the first result. Okay. So that's what the expectation of that expression is concerned. All right. Okay. Now we're going to look at the variance too. Okay. So that's going to be the next thing. All right. So the variance. I'm going to continue here. So the variance of the process obviously is going to be okay so here you have the variance of the process is going to be the variance of the whole thing okay so this is going to be the variance of the constant okay plus the sum same thing okay so you have j being equal to zero to plus infinity and then you have a to the power of j times the white noises okay that's what it's going to be. 
right? So this is the variance. All right. Now, of course, the variance does not depend on this additive expression here. Okay. So maybe remember that the variance of a linear transformation, okay, is going to be b squared times the variance. Right. So the variance does not depend on this additive constant. Okay. And we have that the variance of the sum is the sum of the variances. So basically, this is going to be equal to, I mean, let me just give it a statement here. So basically, this is going to be the variance of the sum. Okay? So let's do this first. Okay? And then you have the sum of the variances, obviously. Okay? So then you have the sum of the variances. And the reason for that is because the white noise is so independent. Okay? So since the white noise is independent, we have that the sum of the variance of the sum is equal to the sum of the variances. Obviously. And now since you see that the variance of a of a linear transformation is basically equal to b squared, you know, so times that that's one, and you, you see that here so we have a to the power of j. And since we have to take the square of that. To get rid of or to get this out of the variance operator, you're going to have that this, this sum will be equal to, I mean, you see this here, so you have j is equal to 0 till plus infinity of a to the power of j squared, right? Because you have to take the square of that times the variance of the white noise. Okay? Now the variance of the white noise is equal to sigma squared. Okay? So this is equal to sigma squared, obviously. Right? That was the variance of the white noise, which was given by definition, of course. So therefore, what you do afterwards, okay? So you factorize, factorize this sum here. So this is going to be equal to this sigma squared times the variance of the sum. And I'm going to write the exponent here differently, okay? So here you have in the first in the first expression you have a to the power of j, and then you take the square of that. And I'm going to reverse this. So I'm going to take, first I'm going to take the square of it, and then I take that to the power of j. So that makes it a little bit easier. Okay? All right? Now, since this expression, okay, is less than equal, is, uh, is less than 1, and then the corresponding formula for geometric series applies, so maybe you know this, right? So this one here, I'm talking about this formula. So q to the power of j from j is equal to 0 to plus infinity is equal to 1 over 1 minus q, okay? If, let's say, the absolute value of q is less than 0, or less than 1, sorry. Okay? So that is the formula that applies here. We have a geometric series. Okay, so then from this, I'm going to turn that to, um, this is going to be sigma squared, okay? So sigma squared times 1 over, 1 minus a squared, and that's going to be the variance. Okay, so that's finally the variance, and then you can see that this is uh, this is the expression that we have here. Okay. Okay, so that's the result. Okay, so that does not depend on time either. Okay, it's obviously okay. So the variance and both the expectation does not depend on time. Okay. And the same is true for expectation as well. Okay? Right? Now the covariance is a little bit difficult. Okay? So I'm gonna I'm gonna consider that also. Okay. That was easy actually. The covariance is a little bit more, I'd say not difficult, but it looks like a little bit uh, a little bit more complicated then. Okay? Can I continue guys? Okay, you got this? Okay, all right, so what about the covariance of the two? Okay. Now basically, I mean, maybe you remember, so the covariance here of yt and uh, yt plus h, okay, so basically maybe you remember the following statement, so the covariance of the linear transformation, okay, so the covariance of a plus b times x and c plus d times y is going to be just equal to b times d times the covariance of x and y. Okay, so 
Based on that, I can get rid of, basically, I can get rid of the additive expression, so you can see this here. So here, for instance, I have the covariance of the first expression. Okay, so the first expression is, of course, a constant, okay, 1 minus a plus the sum, okay, the sum of the white noises. The sum starts at 0, okay. That's the first expression, okay. Okay, and here you have the second one. The second one, there you have the constant 2, okay? So then you have the sum, okay? And this time around, you, the sum starts at 0 uh, as well, okay? So that's going to be the same thing. But here you don't have the white noise at point t minus j. You have the white noise at point t plus h minus j. That's going to be it. Okay, so T, okay, I'm going to add this here to see it better, plus H minus J, that's the difference, okay? So that's the difference between the two expressions, okay? So that's the first one and that's the second one. And as I said before in a previous statement, you, have, you can get rid of this, uh, this additive constants here, so basically you can get rid of those, okay? So then you're going to just have the covariance of the two sums, okay? All right? That's, that should be obvious, okay? Now, the question is how I'm gonna deal with that. And maybe you remember the following statement, so that was in example 1.5, I think. So you have the covariance of its sum, okay? So you have, let's say, x plus y, and then here you have x plus z. And these variables are not correlated, okay? So in that case, this was equal to the variance of x, okay? If, let's say, the, the, var the variables are pairwisely uncorrelated, okay? So if x, y, and z are pairwisely uncorrelated. Okay, so basically what does it mean? It basically means that you only need to look at, okay, so only need to look at the white noises because white noises are uncorrelated, which have the same index. Okay, so as soon as they have the same index, then they just then you just take the variance of them and you leave out the rest. Okay? So I'm I'm talking about these indices here. So y t minus j and here I'm talking about uh, so, uh, so you have epsilon t minus j and you have t plus h minus j. And of course if h is greater than zero, then the corresponding indices aren't equal. So if they're not equal, then there is no correlation between them. Okay, so then you just, you can neglect those. Okay, and I'm going to rewrite this expression so you see this better. Okay, so that's how you're going to, how you're going to see it because what I'm going to do here is I'm going to split this up. Okay, so here you have the covariance of the first expression. That's going to be um, the next step. Okay, so you just keep the covariance. Okay, so you have the covariance of the first sum. Okay, I leave it as it is. Okay, so j starts at zero and you have plus infinity, and then you have a to the power of j times the white noise. Okay, that's going to be the first one. Okay, and here I'm going to continue with the second one. Now, here you have the second one, I'm going to split this up. Okay, so what I'm going to do here is I'm going to compute the sum from j is equal to zero to h minus one. Okay, so I'm going to split this up here. So this expression, I'm talking about this one, okay? So we're going to continue here below. So here you have the sum, okay? And that goes from, from zero to infinity, and what I'm going to do now is going to split it up. So I'm going to consider the sum from j is equal to zero to h minus one, all right? And then afterwards, I'm going to continue counting from j is equal to h to plus infinity. Okay, so I'm, I'm going to split up the sum here. Okay, so because that basically it will give me the result from j is equal to zero to plus infinity as, as it was denoted here. Okay, you see that, guys? Okay, so just what I'm going to do here is I'm going to split it up. Okay, I'm keeping everything as it is. Okay, so here you have a to the power of j times epsilon t plus h, right? So here you have plus h minus j. Okay, so you have the first one. And uh, 
this is the first one, right? And here you have the second one, so a to the power of j times epsilon t plus h minus j, again, okay? So again, this is the same thing as expression above, okay? First off, you get rid of the constants, okay? So you get rid of the constants, that's obvious. And in the second part, you just, you just split up this sum here, okay? So this sum that we had consists of the two here, this one plus that one. You see, that was, uh, that was just it, okay? Now why I'm been doing this? Because the white noises are uncorrelated, okay? So since the white noises are uncorrelated, we have that this expression does not correlate with this one. So since these two do not correlate with each other, the correlation will be equal to zero. So therefore, I can leave this out, okay? So I can leave this out based on that statement, okay? So if you have a covariance of two sums, okay, then you only need to look at the corresponding variables which are correlated, namely here x and x, okay? So since, I mean, here we have multiple sums, okay? So this sum, I mean, it starts from t till t minus infinity, let's say, and here you have t plus h, so, so that's, the, that's gonna be the first one, okay? And the last one is gonna be t plus h minus h minus one, which is gonna be t plus one, okay? So this sum goes, okay? So that, that's what you can see here. So this, this goes from t plus h until t plus one, okay? And that starts at t, okay? And t, and this goes to minus infinity, you see? We don't really to talk about this expression. Okay, so that starts at t and goes to minus infinity. And here, this one starts at t plus h and it stops at t plus one. Okay, so that means that there are no white noises here which are equal in the sum. Okay, so they are all different here, right? Okay, since they're all different, you just can leave this out. Okay, so basically what you have, based on the statement here, because they're pairwise uncorrelated, okay, so you can just leave them out, and then basically what you have is that this is going to be just equal to the covariance of the first sum, this is what you have, so this one, okay, so the covariance of the first one, j is equal to zero to plus infinity of a to the power of j times the white noise, okay, that's going to be the first sum, and then just leave out this expression, and you're just going to have the second one. So that starts, okay? That starts from j is equal to h, all right? So j is equal to h to plus infinity, and we have a to the power of j times epsilon t plus h minus j. Okay, so because the two here above this one and this one aren't correlated, okay? None of them are the same, okay? So here this sum goes from t plus h here from the index and it stops at t plus one and these are all greater, I mean, you have a great time lag, greater time lag than this, this goes from t to minus infinity. So basically you have that no, of none of them are, um, which are here, in this expression are considered to be here in this expression and vice versa, okay? So none of them are the same, so they, that T2 are uncorrelated, so this is what you're gonna have, all right? Now, you can see this here that this sum, and you have the index here, okay? So I'm talking about this index here, okay? So if you use this, then where does it start? So if you put J being equal to H, so then it's gonna be starting here, so this expression will start at t, all right, and then it will go down to minus infinity, as you can see this here, all right? So what you can do here is basically, you can redefine the summation index as follows. I can, uh, or I can show this to you, okay? So this will be the covariance. Okay, so you're gonna have the covariance of the first sum, that doesn't change, okay? So here you're gonna have j is equal to zero to 
plus infinity differs in shape, so you have a to the power of j times epsilon t minus j. And here for the second part, you just redefine the summation index. So here it starts at, at, at j is equal to h, okay? So what I'm going to do now, I'm just going to let it start at j is equal to zero, okay? So because that, that summation, if you look at the time index here, you, you have to dispose from t till negative infinity, okay? So this is what I'm going to have. So I'm going to redefine this. I'll leave a little space here. So here you're going to have epsilon t minus j, so then the two will become equal. But you have to be careful because here you have the, the a to the power of j, and if h, uh, j, sorry, starts at h, then you have a to the power of h is going to be the first exponent. Okay, so a to the power of h is going to be the first exponent, a, a to the power of h plus one is going to be the second one, and so forth. So if you just take a to the power of j, then you have a to the power of zero, which is going to be the first one. So you have to add h here to that expression, and that's what you're going to have. All right. So that's basically what you what you're going to what you're going to see there. All right. Okay. So this is what you do. Okay. All right. Now, and, and here, I'm looking at this expression. You, here you have, of course, that this is going to be equal to a to the power of j times a to the power of h. So you can get rid of a to the power of h here from the sum. So this is going to be, and then you're going to see this here. So this is going to be equal to a to the power of j times the covariance of the two expressions. And the two expressions are now going to be equal. Okay? So basically, you have the covariance of the first one, a to the power of j times epsilon t minus j, and the covariance of the second one, a to the power of j times epsilon t minus j, okay? And the sum, both of them, okay, both of them go from zero to plus infinity, okay? So then the sum is gonna be equal, okay? Now the covariance of a random variable in itself is gonna be the variance of the random variable, Okay, so from here to there, the covariance is going to be equal to the variance, and we have already calculated the variance, so this is going to be equal to a to the power of j times the variance of the sum. Okay, let me write it down so that you see it here as well. Okay, so this is going to be a to the power of j times the variance of the sum. Okay, so j starts at 0 and then you have plus infinity. And then, of course, we already considered the variance of the sum. And the variance of the sum has been, and then you have it here, so a, a to the power of h, sorry, not j. Damn it. This is uh, a to the power of h. I apologize here for that. This is going to be the factor that you factorize. So you have a to the power of h, not j. j is a summation index. So it cannot be true. Okay? I apologize for that. I was uh, having a mistake here. So here you have a to the power of h, and then you can get rid of that here. So you have a to the power of h times the covariance, and here you have the same thing. So this is going to be a to the power of h times the variance. Okay, and now a is of course less than, or the absolute value of that is less than one. So here you are going to have a to the power of h times sigma squared times, and then you have of course the variance expression, which is one over one minus a squared. That's going to be the after covariance. Okay? So now you see that the after covariance does not depend on time either. Okay, so this does not depend depend on time either. Okay? Obviously. So that's what you do, what you're gonna have as a result. Okay? This is the after covariance. Okay? So now, of course, since these expressions do not depend on, do not depend on uh, time, okay, so neither the expectation nor the variance nor the covariance, then of course you're going to have that um, the process is, uh, is stationary. Okay, so this means that, okay, so y is stationary.
Good. Okay. Now then I'm going to continue. Okay. Is that clear? All right. So let me just summarize. Okay. So this was because this is what we had. Okay. So basically, if let's say, okay. So if and uh, that's this is important, guys. So if yt is an autoregressive process, first order autoregressive process to be precise. Okay. And of course, the absolute value is going to be equal to uh, is less than one of the constant. Okay. So we have times. Then basically what you have is the expectation of the process is equal to V over 1 minus A. The variance of the process is going to be equal to sigma squared over 1 minus A squared. And the autocovariance of the process, okay, T plus H, is going to be equal to A to the power of H times sigma squared over 1 minus A squared. Okay, so this is what the result is. So finally, if this is the case, then you have that the process y is stationary. Okay. Now, I managed to shut down my computer and uh, to reinstall everything until then. So I want to continue not just using the papers because I'll probably think that you don't see the grid, but uh, maybe I'll try the computer now. Okay. Okay guys, now the question is what happens in case, let's say, the time is not bounded. Okay, so, I mean, let's say you have the following, okay, so let's say if, and this is going to be the next, the next lemma here, so let's say if, okay, so if time, okay, is, let's say, equal to um, a set of natural numbers, okay, and uh, let's say, and of course, then, we have to have that the absolute value of the constant is less than one, then of course the process is going to be something else. Okay, so then the representation of the process is going to be, and then this is what you're going to have here. So this is yt, and then you have the constant, okay, and then plus a to the power of t times the starting value. And then you have plus the sum that goes from j is equal to 0. Okay, so j equals 0 till p minus 1 of a to the power of j times the white noise. Okay, now here, of course, since the time, okay, so since here the time is bounded from below, okay, so here you have that, of course. And then I add this here as a remark, so here you have that the time is bounded from below. Okay. Okay. So because, why is that? Of course, because here you have the set of natural numbers, okay, so representing the time. So there is such a thing as a starting value. So if you have the starting value, then of course, the notation here changes. You don't have plus infinity here, okay, so the time is bounded from below, then of course you have that in this case, and this is something that you can, you can consider, okay, so in this case, okay, 
um, you have that uh, the expectation. Well, that's, that's wrong now. Just a moment. Okay. okay. So then, of course, you have that the expectation of the process is going to be a little bit different. Okay. So the expectation is going to be the constant. Okay. And then you have plus a t, a to the power of t times the expectation of the starting value. Now, of course, you can assume that the starting value is equal to some constant almost surely, but unless it's not zero, okay, so then the process is just asymptotically stationary, okay? And of course, then you have also that the variance of the process is gonna be equal to, and then you're gonna see this result, so sigma squared times one over, sorry, one minus a to the power of two times t over one minus a squared times, and then you have plus a to the power of two times t times the variance of the starting value, okay? Now, even though, let's say that the expectation is not equal to zero, here you have that the variance depends on time. Okay, so here is the time dependency, right? But if you have that the absolute value, which is which is here, right? So if you have that the absolute value of the process uh, of the of the constant here is less than one, then this this thing here will converge to zero, right? So the process is not stationary, as you can see, because it depends on. I mean, the variance depends on time, but the process is going to be as in total, as in total stationary, right? Okay, so that's that's what the result is going to be. Okay, and I'm going to also giving you the autocovariance, and the autocovariance of the process, okay, is going to be, and then you see, so the autocovariance here of the process, okay, so y t and y t plus h, and that's going to be here also as a result. So here you have a to the power of h times sigma squared times 1 minus a to the power of 2 times t and then over 1 minus a to the power of 2. So in this case, you have a time dependency, okay? So the time dependency of the, of the variance and of the of the auto covariance, I mean, usually the time dependency for the uh, for the expectation as well, unless let's say you would have the starting values equal to zero, so you can make it out that. But you can see that the the process is not stationary. Okay, so this means and this implies that y is not stationary. Okay, in general. In general, still. So you can see that here that the time, if the time is not bounded from below, then the process is not stationary, even though the absolute value of the constant is, or the absolute value of the slope coefficient is less than one. Okay, so even though this condition holds, if the time is not bounded from below, then the variance of the process depends on time, basically. Okay, but okay, but it's asymptotically stationary. Okay, however, the process is asymptotically stationary. So, however, y is as integrated stationary. Okay. That's um, that's for sure. That's for sure. Okay. All right. Okay. Now I'm not going to show this. Okay, so I'm not going to show this, that this is, of course, um, obvious, but you can see this here. I mean, um, let's say, why is that? Okay, but you can see, I mean, the parameters are, are clear. But, of course, I mean, if you take the limit, okay, so if the limit of the expectation, okay, and let's say as t converges to infinity, then you have, of course, the limit of this expression. Okay, so here you have b over 1 minus a and then plus a to the power of t times the expectation, okay? Now if t converges to infinity, right, of that expression, then basically you would have that this is going to be b 
v over 1 minus a plus the limit, okay? Okay, so then you have the expectation, okay, times the limit then, okay, so the limit of a to the power of t as t approaches infinity, and of course the limit here of that is going to be equal to zero because, okay, so this is going to be equal to zero because the coefficient a or the absolute value of the coefficient is going to be less than one. Okay, so again, so, and of course, you would have that this is going to be equal to v, v over 1 minus a, so which does not depend on time. Okay, so this does not depend on time. Okay, so then of course you're going to see that the limit of the expectation does not depend on time, and the limit of the variance will not depend on time either. And the limit of the autocovariance will not depend on time either. So then, of course, you're going to see that the process is not is, is not stationary, but it's as a total is stationary. Okay, obviously. So that's uh, that's uh, that is done analogously, but um, I'm not going to do this. Okay, so I'm not going to elaborate on that because that's that's relatively easy. Okay, so the limit of that. Okay, here you're going to have that this expression will converge to zero. Okay, and that expression will converge to zero. So then you just have to, uh, you're just going to have sigma squared times one over one minus a. Squared. Now in practice, okay, so the boundedness of time, okay, so here you're going to see that time, the time is not bounded from below, uh, is bounded from below, and the unboundedness of time is basically not really relevant, okay. So in practice, this doesn't mean, okay, that you're going to have to consider that as a as an assumption, okay. So basically, this assumption is is just neglected, and then we all see that. If let's say the, the the parameter here or the absolute value of the parameter is less than one, then the process is going to be stationary uh, from the practical point of view. Period. Okay, because the concept that the time is bounded from below is basically a theoretical concept. Okay, which uh, which has basically no relevance in practice. Okay, so that's that's what you're going to have here. This is all you need to consider. Okay. You understand? So this is just from the theoretical perspective, which is important, but not from the practical one. Again, from the practical one. If the absolute value of the coefficient is less than one, then the process is considered to be stationary. Okay? So this is just going to be from the practical point of view. Okay? So you don't have to assume that the time is, is bounded from the whole way. Okay? Now, I'm going to continue. Okay? So this is the first, um, first important note here. Maybe we could also calculate the correlation. Okay, so the autocorrelation is going to be as follows. So you're going to see this here. So what's going to be the autocorrelation? Okay, so the autocorrelation, since the process is stationary, is of course it's going to be equal to the covariance of the process. So you have the covariance of yt and uh, yt plus h divided by the standard deviations. Okay, so divided by the product of the standard deviation of the first one times the standard deviation of the second one. Okay? And basically we have the variances. So I mean the covariance was equal to, and then you 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 see this here. So it was equal to a to the power of h times sigma squared times one over one minus a squared. And then here for the variance is you have the square root of the same thing because the, it is not stationary. So here you have sigma squared times one over one minus a squared, and then you're going to have sigma squared times one over one minus a squared. That's going to be the same thing, okay? So basically, you have that the autocorrelation is just equal to a to the power of h if the process is stationary, okay? So if y is stationary. So by using this expression, you can just calculate the autocorrelation. Okay, not a big deal, but of course, you can see that the autocorrelation vanishes. Okay, so if the time lag, right? So if the time lag h goes to infinity, right? right then of course the autocorrelation is uh, autocorrelation will converge to zero. Okay, so let's say that the limit of the autocorrelation Okay, it's going to be equal to zero, all right, as h approaches infinity. Okay, so the more you're looking back to time, 
the less relevant the outer correlation is going to be. That's quite obvious as well. Okay? So, basically, I mean, uh, the meaning of the outer correlation is less important okay, for, for time distances that are quite large. Okay? That's what the process says here. Okay? Good. Now, okay, so here in the lecture notes, you're going to see some samples for different values here. Of, of, uh, of a. I'm not going to illustrate this, but you can look it up. And maybe I'm, when we look at the practical, point, uh, practical perspective, then I'm going to show you how this process will look like, okay, depending on the value of a. But this is not going to be considered here. So I'm going to move to see the next chapter, which will be about the lag operator. Okay. And I'm going to use that here for that too. Okay, so what you have is the following definition for the lag operator. Okay, and this is somehow a little bit, a uh, little bit weird, guys. Okay, so because it's not intuitive from from the perspective here. So the, what is a lag operator? And I'm going to call the lag operator capital L. Okay. So basically what you have is that if you multiply, let's say if you have a process here, okay, at point T, and you multiply that process by a leg operator, okay, so let's say, and, and I call this capital L, and to the power of K, then the result is going to be, and this is what you have here, so this is going to be Y, T, minus K, okay? So guys, this is just a representation. There is no mathematical calculus here involved. Okay? This is just a this is just a operator. Okay, so here of course we have that k is an element of the whole numbers, okay? And that is a lag operator. Now there's this is not a real multiplication here, guys. Okay, so you have to be aware of this. This is not a real multiplication, this is just a representation of that process. Okay, so this is just a representation. Let me just put more emphasis here on that statement. Okay, so no real multiplication, guys. No real powers. Okay, so this is not an exponent, or not a real exponent, let's say, but this is just a representation, okay, of the lag process. Okay, representation of the value here, y t minus k. Okay, so this is the lag value you say. Okay? The lag value of the process. Okay? Alright, so basically consider that this is not a real multiplication. Okay, so the lag operator is denoted by capital L. Okay? And capital L to the power of k times a process is going to be equal to the lag value of the process here. Okay? At point t minus k. That's just going to be it. Okay, so no, basically no um, representation here. Okay, now let's say if you multiply the lag operator, okay, so this is going to be important here. If you multiply the lag operator by a constant, okay, so here you have the lag operator, and you multiply that by a constant, okay, times c, then of course this does not depend on time, it is not a random variable, so what you're going to get is basically the constant itself. Okay, so nothing more, nothing less. That's that's for sure. Okay? Again, when I first saw this, I was kind of struggling with this concept, okay, because I was constantly, you know, trying to multiply or something. But I realized after that that this is just a representation of the timeline of the process, so that makes a lot of things easier for representation reasons. Okay, not basically for for real calculations, okay? So you don't have a real multiplication here, although it's noted that way. Uh, that way. Okay, so I say, I'm mean, literally, I say L to the power of K times the process, but this is just something which, which turns the process into a lagged value of the process, which means that you have a realization at point T minus K instead of T. That's it, okay? So don't worry about it, okay? You don't need to imagine that to be as a multiplication. I mean, it could be also another operator. Okay, now if, if you want to represent, let's say, a process, okay, so here you have um, 
yt, okay, which is equal to v plus a times yt minus 1 plus epsilon t, okay? So then what you basically can do is the following. So you, I mean, you subtract yt minus, uh, y, uh, so you subtract a times yt minus 1, okay, on both sides of the equation. So you have yt, and then you have minus a times yt minus 1, okay? Which is equal to the constant plus the y noise, obviously. So far, so good, okay? And now what I'm going to do here is, basically, what you have is that I'm going to, I'm going to uh, call this as what you have here. So what you have is a lag polynomial, okay? So we'll have, okay, so a to the power of a of l, okay? So we have the lag operator, okay, times yt is going to be equal to the constant plus the y noise. And then I'm going to define here this function, which is going to be a polynomial. So here you have a of l that is equal to 1 minus a times l. Okay? And this function is called the lag polynomial. Okay? So this is, is called the lag polynomial. Okay, so that is called the lag polynomial of the process. Okay, again, so why I'm doing this because this is a representation. Okay, this is a representation of a first-order autoregressive model. Okay, right. So that's the way basically to represent it, and by using this lag polynomial. Okay, and um, if I define a lag polynomial differently. Then of course I would we would get a different representation. Now guys, do you understand this why this is this is accurate here? I mean if you put put in the lag polynomial, you have basically you have okay one minus a times l it times the process is going to be equal to the constant plus the white noise. Okay? And one times yt is going to be equal to yt, as you see there, and negative a times the lag polynomial, okay or times L times YT is going to be A times YT minus 1. You see this? Okay? Maybe you don't see this right. I, let me just illustrate this again. So, okay, so we have the lag polynomial times the process is going to be equal to the constant plus the white noise. Okay? And if I define the lag polynomial as follows, so you have 1 minus A times L. So then basically what you're going to have is that this process will be represented as 1 minus a times l times yt, okay, which is going to be v plus epsilon t, obviously. And if you multiply that, okay, so basically you have 1 times yt minus a times l times yt, obviously. Okay. That's the same thing. And now here what the lag operator does Okay? If you multiply the lag operator by the process yt, then you're going to get, here in this example, you're going to get, obviously, you're going to get yt minus a times yt minus 1. That's what the lag operator does. Okay? So then, basically, what you have is the first order autoregressive process. Okay? Now, why is this useful? Because Depending on the characteristics of the lag polynomial, I can impose stationary conditions, not just in first order autoregressive processes, but also on autoregressive processes of order P or something, or higher order autoregressive processes. Okay? So I'm gonna, okay, so here of course you're gonna see, right? So that's that's what you what you have here, right? So this is the, the lag polynomial. Okay, and based on that, I'm going to define certain characteristics. Now, when, when was the process stationary? Okay, so the process is stationary, and we have seen this. Okay, and uh, let me just uh, illustrate that so you can see. Okay, 
So y is stationary, and we figure this out. Okay? So y is stationary. If and only if the absolute value of this coefficient is less than one. Okay? That is what we have seen. Of course we would should add, I mean we, we would add of course that the time is not bounded from below, right? That's a, that's another condition, but I will from the practical perspective I mean neglect that. Okay, I'm just I'm just gonna focus in on here on this one. Okay? Now what happens to the roots here, let's say if y if uh, if a is less than e, uh, equal, I mean, if less, uh, the absolute value is less than one. Now, if the absolute value of, uh, of that is less than one, then what you're going to have is basically, okay, so if let's say, if you look at the lag polynomial, okay, so one minus a times l, and you calculate the roots of the lag polynomial, okay, so which is, let's say, is equal to zero, okay. And what I'm going to here, I'm going to use not the lag operator here instead because the calculation here is a little bit difficult. But let's say I just use a regular, regular value of x. Okay, so if let's say I calculate the roots here of the lag polynomial, okay, so basically this will turn out to be so this is going to be one minus a times x, which is equal to zero. And I'm going to solve this for x. Okay, so x is going to be, and then you're going to see what it is. So this is going to be one over a. So if the absolute value of a is going to be less than less than 1, then basically what you have is that the absolute value of the roots of the lag polynomial are going to be greater than 1. You see? Alright? Okay, so basically and this is going to be the absolute value okay, so this is going to be what you're going to see here. The absolute value of the root, okay, is going to be greater than 1. And that is a condition that also applies for other processes. Okay? So that is a characteristic. Okay? Let me just summarize that. Okay? So this is going to be an important lemma here. Okay? So y is stationary. Okay? If and only if, okay, if and only if the roots, okay, you know what roots are, guys, roots of a function, okay? Roots are a function or points that you put into the function and the result is zero, okay? In German you say, you don't say roots, in German you say Nullstelle, all right? So maybe you, you know this word, okay? So Nullstelle is called the root, okay? Not the square root, okay? So this is something else, okay? So if the roots, of the lag polynomial of its lag polynomial 